The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 12, Side 1. A further effort to preserve Japanese poetry from time's mortality was made by the Emperor Daigo, who brought together 1,100 poems of the preceding 150 years into an anthology known as the Kokinshu, Poems Ancient and Modern. His chief aide was the poet-scholar Tsurayuki, whose preface seems more interesting to us today than the fragments which the book has brought down to us from his laconic muse. The poetry of Japan as a seed springs from the heart of man creating countless leaves of language. In a world full of things, man strives to find words to express the impression left on his heart by sight and sound. And so the heart of man came to find expression in words for his joy in the beauty of blossoms, his wonder at the song of birds, and his tender welcome of the mists that bathe the landscapes, as well as his mournful sympathy with the evanescent morning dew. To verse the poets were moved when they saw the ground white with snowy showers of fallen cherry blossoms on spring mornings, or heard on autumn evenings the rustle of falling leaves, or year after year gazed upon the mirror's doleful reflections of the ravages of time, or trembled as they watched the ephemeral dewdrop quivering on the beaded grass. Tsurayuki well expressed the recurrent theme of Japanese poetry, the moods and phases, the blossoming and decay of nature in isles made scenic by volcanoes and verdant with abundant rain. The poets of Japan delight in the less hackneyed aspects of field and woods and sea, trout splashing in mountain brooks, frogs leaping suddenly into noiseless pools, shores without tides, hills cut with motionless mists, or a drop of rain nestling like a gem in a folded blade of grass. Often they interweave a song of love with their worship of the growing world, or more elegiacally the brevity of flowers, love, and life. Seldom, however, does this nation of warriors sing of war, and only now and then does his poetry lift the heart in hymns. After the Nara period, the great majority of the poems were brief. Out of eleven hundred in the Kokinshu, all but five were in the pithy tanka form, five lines of five, seven, five, seven, and seven syllables. In these poems there is no rhyme, for the almost invariable vowel ending of the Japanese words would have left too narrow a variety for the poet's choice. Nor is there any accent, tone, or quantity. There are strange tricks of speech, pillow words or meaningless prefixes added for the sake of euphony, prefaces or sentences prefixed to a poem to round out its form rather than to develop its ideas, and pivot words used punningly in startling diversities of sense to bind one sentence with the next. These to the Japanese are devices sanctified by time, like alliteration or rhyme to the English, and their popular appeal does not draw the poet into vulgarity. On the contrary, these classic poems are essentially aristocratic in thought and form. Born in a courtly atmosphere, they are fashioned with an almost haughty restraint. They seek perfection of modeling rather than novelty of meaning. They suppress rather than express emotion, and they are too proud to be anything but brief. Nowhere else have writers been so expressively reticent. It is as if the poets of Japan had had a mind to atone by their modesty for the braggadocio of her historians. To write three pages about the West Wind, say the Japanese, is to show a plebeian verbosity. The real artist must not so much think for the reader as lure him into active thought. He must seek and find one fresh perception that will arouse in him all the ideas and all the feelings which the Occidental poet insists on working out in self-centered and monopolistic detail. Each poem to the Japanese must be the quiet record of one moment's inspiration. So we shall be misled if we seek in these anthologies, or in that golden treasury of Japan, the Hyaku Nin Ishu, single verses by a hundred people, any heroic or epic strain, any sustained or lyric flight, these poets, like the rash wits of the Mermaid Tavern, were willing to hang their lives on a line. So when Saigyo Hoshi, having lost his dearest friend, became a monk, and mystically found in the shrines at Ise the solace he was seeking, he wrote no Adonais, or even Elicitus, but these simple lines. What it is that dwelleth here I know not, yet my heart is full of gratitude, and the tears trickle down. And when the lady Kaganochio lost her husband, she wrote merely, All things that seem are but one dreamer's dream. I sleep, I wake, how wide the bed with none beside. 
Then, having lost also her child, she added two lines. Today, how far may he have wandered, the brave hunter of dragonflies? In the imperial circles at Nara and Kyoto, the composition of tankas became an aristocratic sport. Female chastity, which in ancient India had required an elephant as its price, was often satisfied at these courts with thirty-one syllables of poetry cleverly turned. It was a usual thing for the emperor to entertain his guests by handing them words with which to fashion a poem, and the literature of the time refers casually to people conversing with one another in acrostic poetry or reciting tankas as they walked in the streets. Periodically, at the height of the Heian age, the emperor arranged a poetry contest or tournament in which as many as fifteen hundred candidates competed before learned judges in the making of tanka epigrams. In 951, a special poetry bureau was established for the management of these jousts, and the winning pieces in each contest were deposited in the archives of the institution. In the 16th century, Japanese poetry felt guilty of long-windedness and decided to shorten the tanka, originally the completion by one person of a poem begun by another, into the hoku, a single utterance of three lines boasting of five, seven, and five syllables, or seventeen in all. In the Genroku age, 1688 to 1704, the composition of these hoku became first a fashion, then a craze. For the Japanese people resembles the American in an emotional intellectual sensitivity that makes for the rapid rise and fall of mental styles. Men and women, merchants and warriors, artisans and peasants neglected the affairs of life to match hoku epigrams, constructed at a moment's warning. The Japanese, with whom gambling is a favorite passion, wagered so much money in hoku-composing contests that some enterprising souls made a business of conducting them, fleecing thousands of devotees daily, until at last the government was forced to raid these poetical resorts and prohibit this new mercenary art. The most distinguished master of the hoku was Matsura Basho, 1643-1694, whose birth, it seemed to Yone Noguchi, was the greatest happening in our Japanese annals. Basho, a young samurai, was so deeply moved by the death of his lord and teacher that he abandoned the life of the court, renounced all physical pleasures, gave himself to wandering, meditation, and teaching, and expressed his quiet philosophy in fragments of nature poetry highly revered by Japanese literati as perfect examples of concentrated suggestion. The old pond, I, and the sound of a frog leaping into the water. Or, a stem of grass, whereon a dragonfly essayed to light. 3. Prose 1. Fiction Lady Murasaki, The Tale of Genji, Its Excellence, Later Japanese Fiction, A Humorist If Japanese poems are too brief for the taste of the Western mind, we may console ourselves with the Japanese novel, whose masterpieces run into twenty, sometimes thirty, volumes. The most highly regarded of them is the Genji Monogatari, literally and undeniably gossip about Genji, which in one edition fills 4,234 pages. This delightful romance was composed about the year 1001 A.D. by the lady Murasaki no Shikibu. A Fujiwara of ancient blood, she married another Fujiwara in 997, but was left a widow four years later. She dulled her sorrow by writing an historical novel in fifty-four books. After filling all the papers she could find, she laid sacrilegious hands upon the sacred sutras of a Buddhist temple and used them for manuscript. Even paper was once a luxury. The hero of the tale is the son of an emperor by his favorite concubine, Kiritsubo, who is so beautiful that all the other concubines are jealous of her and actually tease her to death. Murasaki, perhaps exaggerating the male's capacity for devotion, represents the emperor as inconsolable. As the years went by, the emperor did not forget his lost lady, and though many women were brought to the palace in the hope that he might take pleasure in them, he turned from them all, believing that there was not anyone in the world like her whom he had lost. Continually he pined that fate should not have allowed them to fulfill the vow which morning and evening was ever talked of between them, the vow that their lives should be as the twin birds that share a wing, the twin trees that share a bough. Genji grows up to be a dashing prince, with more looks than morals. He passes from one mistress to another with the versatility of Tom Jones, and outmodes that conventional hero by his indifference to gender. He is a woman's idea of a man, all sentiment and seduction, always brooding and languishing over one woman or the next. 
Occasionally, in great unhappiness, he returned to his wife's house. The Lady Morasaki retails his adventures gaily, and excuses him and herself with irresistible grace. The young prince would be thought to be positively neglecting his duty if he did not indulge in a few escapades, and everyone would regard his conduct as perfectly natural and proper, even when it was such as they would not have dreamed of permitting to ordinary people. I should indeed be very loath to recount in all their detail matters which he took so much trouble to conceal, did I not know that if you found that I had omitted anything, you would at once ask why. Just because he was supposed to be an emperor's son, I must needs put a favorable showing on his conduct by leaving out all his indiscretions. And you would soon be saying that this was no history, but a mere made-up tale designed to influence the judgment of posterity. As it is, I shall be called a scandal-monger, but that I cannot help. In the course of his amours, Genji falls ill, repents him of his adventures, and visits a monastery for pious converse with a priest. But there he sees a lovely princess, modestly named Murasaki, and thoughts of her distract him as the priest rebukes him for his sins. The priest began to tell stories about the uncertainty of this life and the retributions of the life to come. Genji was appalled to think how heavy his own sins had already been. It was bad enough to think that he would have them on his conscience for the rest of his present life. But then there was also the life to come. What terrible punishments he had to look forward to! And all the while the priest was speaking, Genji thought of his own wickedness. What a good idea it would be to turn hermit and live in some such place! But immediately his thoughts strayed to the lovely face which he had seen that afternoon, and longing to know more of her, he asked, Who lives with you here? By cooperation of the author, Genji's first wife dies in childbirth, and he is left free to give first place in his home to his new princess, Murasaki. The present writer regrets that the brevity of life has prevented his reading more than the first of the four volumes into which Arthur Whaley has so perfectly translated Murasaki's tale. It may be that the excellence of the translation gives this book an extraneous advantage over other Japanese masterpieces that have been rendered into English. Perhaps Mr. Whaley, like Fitzgerald, has improved upon his original. If for the occasion we can forget our own moral code and fall in with one that permits men and women, as Wordsworth said of those in Wilhelm Meister, to mate like flies in the air, we shall derive from this tale of Genji the most attractive glimpse yet opened to us of the beauties hidden in Japanese literature. Murasaki writes with a naturalness and ease that soon turn her pages into the charming gossip of a cultured friend. The men and women, above all the children, who move through her leisurely pages, are ingratiatingly real. And the world which she describes, though it is confined for the most part to imperial palaces and palatial homes, has all the color of a life actually lived or seen. It is an aristocratic life, not much concerned with the cost of bread and love, but within that limitation it is described without sensational resort to exceptional characters or events, as Lady Murasaki makes Uma no Kami say of certain realistic painters, ordinary hills and rivers, just as they are, houses, such as you may see everywhere, with all their real beauty of harmony and form, quietly to draw such scenes as this, or to show what lies behind some intimate hedge that is folded away far from the world, and thick trees upon some unheroic hill, and all this with befitting care for composition, proportion, and the life, such works demand the highest master's utmost skill, and must needs draw the common craftsman into a thousand blunders. No later Japanese novel has reached the excellence of Genji, or has had so profound an influence upon the literary development of the language. During the eighteenth century fiction had another zenith, and various novelists succeeded in surpassing the Lady Murasaki in the length of their tales or the freedom of their pornography. Santo Kyoden published in 1791 an edifying story-book, but it proved so little to its purpose that the authorities, under the law prohibiting indecency, sentenced him to be handcuffed for fifty days in his own home. Santo was a vendor of tobacco pouches and quack medicines. He married a harlot, and made his first reputation by a volume on the brothels of Tokyo. He gradually reformed the morals of his pen, but could not unteach his public the habit of buying great quantities of his books. Encouraged, he violated all precedents in the history of Japanese fiction by demanding payment from the men who published his works. His predecessors, it seemed, had been content with an invitation to dinner. Most of the fiction writers were poor bohemians, whom the people classed with actors among the lowest ranks of society. Less sensational and more ably written than Kyoden's were the novels of Kyokutei Bakin, 
1767 to 1848, who, like Scott and Dumas, transformed history into vivid romance. His readers grew so fond of him that he unwound one of his stories into a hundred volumes. Hokusai illustrated some of Bakin's novels until, being geniuses, they quarreled and parted. The jolliest of these later novelists were Japensha Iku, who died in 1831, the Lesage and Dickens of Japan. Iku began his adult life with three marriages, of which two were quickly ended by fathers-in-law who could not understand his literary habits. He accepted poverty with good humor, and having no furniture, hung his bare walls with paintings of the furniture he might have had. On holidays he sacrificed to the gods with pictures of excellent offerings. Being presented with a bathtub in the common interest, he carried it home inverted on his head, and overthrew with ready wit the pedestrians who fell in his way. When his publisher came to see him, he invited him to take a bath, and while his invitation was being accepted, he decked himself in the publisher's clothes and paid his New Year's Day calls in proper ceremonial costume. His masterpiece, the Hizakurige, was published in twelve parts between 1802 and 1822, and told a rollicking tale in the vein of the posthumous papers of the Pickwick Club. Aston calls it the most humorous and entertaining book in the Japanese language. On his deathbed, Iku enjoined his pupils to place upon his corpse, before the cremation then usual in Japan, certain packets which he solemnly entrusted to them. At his funeral, prayers having been said, the pyre was lighted, whereupon it turned out that the packets were full of firecrackers, which exploded merrily. Iku had kept his youthful promise that his life would be full of surprises, even after his death. 2. History The Historians Arai Hakuseki We shall not find Japanese historiography so interesting as its fiction, though we may have some difficulty in distinguishing them. The oldest surviving work in Japanese literature is the Kojiki, or Record of Ancient Things, written in Chinese characters by Yasumaro in 712. Here legend so often takes the place of fact that the highest Shinto loyalty would be needed to accept it as history. After the great reform of 645, the government thought it advisable to transform the past again, and about 720 a new history appeared, the Nihongi, or Record of Nippon, written in the Chinese language and adorned with passages bravely stolen from Chinese works, and sometimes placed, without any fetishism of chronology, in the mouths of ancient Japanese. Nevertheless, the book was a more serious attempt to record the facts than the Kojiki had been, and it provided the foundation for most later histories of early Japan. From that time to this there have been many histories of the country, each more patriotic than the last. In 1334, Kita Batake wrote a history of the true succession of the divine monarchs, the Jinto Shotoki, on this modest and now familiar note. Great Yamato, Japan, is a divine country. It is only our land whose foundations were first laid by the divine ancestor. It alone has been transmitted by the sun goddess to a long line of her descendants. There is nothing of this kind in foreign countries. Therefore it is called the divine land. First printed in 1649, this work began that movement for the restoration of the ancient faith and state which culminated in the passionate polemics of Motoori. The very grandson of Ieyasu, Mitsukuni, by his Dai Nihonshi, The Great History of Japan, 1851, a 240-volume picture of the imperial and feudal past, played a posthumous part in preparing his countrymen to overthrow the Tokugawa shogunate. Perhaps the most scholarly and impartial of Japanese historians was Arai Hakuseki, whose learning dominated the intellectual life of Yedo in the second half of the 17th century. Arai smiled at the theology of the Orthodox Christian missionaries as very childish, but he was bold enough to ridicule also some of the legends which his own people mistook for history. His greatest work, the Han Kampu, a thirty-volume history of the Daimyo, is one of the marvels of literature, for though it must have required much research, it appears to have been composed within a few months. Arai derived something of his learning and judgment from his study of the Chinese philosophers. When he lectured on the Confucian classics, the shogun Ienobu, we are told, listened with rapt and reverent attention, in summer refraining from brushing the mosquitoes from his head, in winter turning his head away from the speaker before wiping his running nose. In his autobiography, Arai paints a devout picture of his father and shows the Japanese citizen at his simplest and best. 
Ever since I came to understand the heart of things, my memory is that the daily routine of his life was exactly the same. He never failed to get up an hour before breakfast. He then had a cold bath and did his hair himself. In cold weather, the woman who was my mother would propose to order hot water for him, but this he would not allow, as he wished to avoid giving the servants trouble. When he was over seventy, and my mother also was advanced in years, sometimes, when the cold weather was unendurable, a lighted brazier was brought in, and they lay down to sleep with their feet against it. Beside the fire was placed a kettle with hot water, which my father drank when he got up. Both of them honored the way of Buddha. My father, when he had arranged his hair and adjusted his clothing, never neglected to make obeisance to Buddha. After he was dressed, he waited quietly for the dawn, and then went out to his official duty. He was never known to betray anger, nor do I remember that even when he laughed he gave way to boisterous mirth. Much less did he ever descend to violent language when he had occasion to reprimand anyone. In his conversation he used as few words as possible. His demeanor was grave. I have never seen him startled, flurried, or impatient. The room he usually occupied, he kept cleanly swept, had an old picture hung on the wall, and a few flowers which were in season were set out in a vase. He would spend the day looking at them. He painted a little in black and white, not being fond of colors. When in good health, he never troubled the servant, but did everything for himself. 3. The Essay The Lady Sei Shonagon, Kamo no Chomei Arai was an essayist as well as an historian, and made brilliant contributions to what is perhaps the most delightful department of Japanese literature. Here, as in fiction, a woman stands at the top, for Lady Sei Shonagon's pillow sketches... Makura Zoshi, is usually accorded the highest as well as the earliest place in this field. Brought up in the same court and generation as Lady Morasaki, she chose to describe the refined and scandalous life about her in casual sketches, whose excellence in the original can only be guessed at by us from the charm that survives in translation. Born of Fujiwara, she rose to be a lady-in-waiting to the Empress. On the latter's death, Lady Sei retired, some say to a convent, others say to poverty. Her book shows no touch of either. She takes the easy morals of her time according to the easy judgment of her time, and does not think too highly of spoil-sport ecclesiastics. A preacher ought to be a good-looking man. It is then easier to keep your eyes fixed on his face, without which it is impossible to benefit by his discourse. Otherwise the eyes wander and you forget to listen. Ugly preachers have therefore a grave responsibility. If preachers were of a more suitable age— I should have pleasure in giving a more favorable judgment. As matters actually stand, their sins are too fearful to think of. She adds little lists of her likes and dislikes. Cheerful things. Coming home from an excursion with the carriages full to overflowing. To have lots of footmen who make the oxen and the carriages speed along. A riverboat going downstream. Teeth nicely blackened. Dreary things. A nursery where a child has died, a brazier with the fire gone out, a coachman who is hated by his ox, the birth of a succession of female children in the house of a scholar, detestable things, people who, when you are telling a story, break in with, oh, I know, and give quite a different version from your own. While on friendly terms with the man, to hear him sound the praises of a woman whom he has known. A visitor who tells a long story when you are in a hurry the snoring of a man whom you are trying to conceal and who has gone to sleep in a place where he has no business. Fleas. The lady's only rival for the highest place in the Japanese essay is Kamo no Chomei. Being refused the succession to his father as the superior guardian of the Shinto shrine of Kamo at Kyoto, Chomei became a Buddhist monk and at fifty retired to a contemplative life in a mountain hermitage. There he wrote his farewell to the busy world under the title of Hojoki, in 1212, that is, the record of ten feet square. After describing the difficulties and annoyances of city life, and the great famine of 1181, quoted previously, he tells how he built himself a hut ten feet square and seven feet high, and settled down contentedly to undisturbed philosophy and a quiet comradeship with natural things. An American, reading him, hears the voice of Thoreau in thirteenth-century Japan. Apparently every generation has had its Walden Pond. 4. The Drama The No Plays, Their Character, The Popular Stage, The Japanese Shakespeare, Summary Judgment Last of all, and hardest to understand, is the Japanese drama. Brought up in our English tradition of the theatre, 
from Henry the Fourth to Mary of Scotland, how shall we ever attune ourselves to tolerate what must seem to us the fustian and pantomime of the no plays of Japan? We must forget Shakespeare and go back to every man, and even farther to the religious origins of Greek and modern European drama. Then we shall be oriented to watch the development of the ancient Shinto pantomime, the ecclesiastical Kagura dance, into that illumination of pantomime by dialogue which constitutes the no or lyrical form of Japanese play. About the fourteenth century, Buddhist priests added choral songs to their processional pantomimes. Then they added individual characters, contrived a plot to give them action as well as speech, and the drama was born. These plays, like the Greek, were performed in trilogies, and occasionally kyogen, or farces, mad words, were acted in the intervals to relieve and facilitate the tension of emotion and thought. The first part of the trilogy was devoted to propitiating the gods, and was hardly more than a religious pantomime. The second was performed in full armor, and was designed to frighten all evil spirits away. The third was of a milder mood, and sought to portray some charming aspect of nature, or some delightful phase of Japanese life. The lines were written for the most part in blank verse of twelve syllables. The actors were men of standing, even among the aristocracy. A playbill survives which indicates that Nobunaga, Hideyoshi, and Ieyasu all participated as actors in a no play about 1580. Each actor wore a mask, carved out of wood with an artistry that makes such masks a prize for the art collector of today. Scenery was meager. The passionate imagination of the audience could be relied upon to create the background of the action. The stories were of the simplest and did not matter much. One of the most popular told of the impoverished samurai who, to warm a wandering monk, cut down his most cherished plants to make a fire, whereupon the monk turned out to be the regent, and gave the knight a goodly reward. But as we in the West may go again and again to hear an opera whose story is old and perhaps ridiculous, so the Japanese even today weep over this oft-told tale, because the excellence of the acting renews on each occasion the power and significance of the play. To the hasty and business-like visitor such performances as he may find of these dramatized lyrics are rather amusing than impressive. Nevertheless, a Japanese poet says of them, Oh, what a tragedy and beauty in the no stage! I always think that it would certainly be a great thing if the no drama could be properly introduced into the West. The result would be no small protest against the Western stage. It would mean a revelation. Japan itself, however, has not composed such plays since the seventeenth century, though it acts them devotedly today. The history of the drama in most countries is a gradual change from the predominance of the chorus to the supremacy of some individual role, at which point in most such sequences development ends. As the histrionic art advanced in tradition and excellence in Japan, it created popular personalities who subordinated the play to themselves. Finally, pantomime and religion sank to a subordinate role, and the drama became a war of individuals, full of violence and romance. So was born the Kabuki Shibai, or popular theater of Japan. The first such theater was established about the year 1600 by a nun who, tired of convent walls, set up a stage at Osaka and practiced dancing for a livelihood. As in England and France, the presence of women on the stage seemed revolting and was forbidden. And since the upper classes, except in safe disguise, shunned these performances, the actors became almost a pariah caste, with no social incentive to keep their profession from immorality and corruption. Men perforce took the parts of women, and carried their imitation to such a point as to deceive not only their audiences but themselves. Many of these actors of female roles remained women off the stage. Perhaps because lighting was poor, the actors painted their faces with vivid colors and wore robes of gorgeous designs to indicate and dignify their roles. Back of the stage, and about it, usually, were choral and individual reciters, who sometimes carried on the vocal parts while the actors confined themselves to pantomime. The audience sat on the matted floor or in tiers of boxes at either side. The most famous name in the popular drama of Japan is Chikamatsu Monzayemon, 1653 to 1724. His countrymen compare Shakespeare. English critics, resenting the comparison, accuse Chikamatsu of violence, extravagance, bombast, and improbable plots, while granting him a certain barbaric vigor and luxuriance. Apparently the similarity is complete. Such foreign plays seem mere melodrama to us, because either the meaning or the nuances of the language are concealed from us. 
but this would probably be the effect of a Shakespearean play upon one unable to appreciate its language or follow its thought. Chikamatsu seems to have made undue use of lovers' suicides to cap his climaxes in the style of Romeo and Juliet, but perhaps with this excuse that suicide was almost as popular in Japanese life as on the stage. A foreign historian in these matters can only report but cannot judge. Japanese acting, to a transient observer, seems less complex and mature, but more vigorous and exalting than the European. Japanese plays seem more plebeianly melodramatic, but less emasculated with superficial intellectualism than the plays of France, England, and America today. So, reversely, Japanese poetry seems slight and bloodless, and too aristocratically refined, to us whose appetite has taken in lyrics of almost epic length, like Maud, and epics of such dullness that doubtless Homer himself would nod if he were compelled to read the accumulated Iliad. The Japanese novel seems sensational and sentimental, and yet two of the supreme masterpieces of English fiction, Tom Jones and Pickwick Papers, have apparently their equal counterparts in the Genji Monogatari and the Hizakurige, and perhaps Lady Murasaki excels in subtlety, grace, and understanding even the great Fielding himself. All things are dull that are remote and obscure, and things Japanese will remain obscure to us until we can completely forget our Western heritage and completely absorb Japan's. 5. The Art of Little Things Creative Imitation, Music and the Dance, Inro and Netsuke, Hidari Jingaro, Lacquer The outward forms of Japanese art, like almost every external feature of Japanese life, came from Japan. The inner force and spirit, like everything essential in Japan, came from the people themselves. It is true that the wave of ideas and immigration that brought Buddhism to Japan in the seventh century brought also, from China and Korea, art forms and impulses bound up with that faith, and no more original with China and Korea than with Japan. It is true, even, that cultural elements entered not only from China and India, but from Assyria and Greece. The features of the Kamakura Buddha, for example, are more Greco-Bactrian than Japanese. But such foreign stimuli were used creatively in Japan. Its people learned quickly to distinguish beauty from ugliness. Its rich men sometimes prized objects of art more than land or gold, and its artists labored with self-effacing devotion. These men, though arduously trained through a long apprenticeship, seldom received more than an artisan's wage. If for a moment wealth came to them, they gave it away with bohemian recklessness and soon relapsed into a natural and comfortable poverty. But only the artist artisans of ancient Egypt and Greece or of medieval China could rival their industry, taste, and skill. The very life of the people was instinct with art. In the neatness of their homes, the beauty of their clothing, the refinements of their ornaments, and their spontaneous addiction to song and dance. For music, like life, had come to Japan from the gods themselves. Had not Izanagi and Izanami sung in choruses at the creation of the earth? A thousand years later, the emperor Inkyo, we read, played on a wagon, a kind of zither, and his empress danced at an imperial banquet given in 419 to signalize the opening of a new palace. When Inkyo died, a Korean king sent eighty musicians to attend the funeral. And these players taught the Japanese new instruments and new modes, some from Korea, some from China, some from India. When the Daibutsu was installed in the temple of Todaiji at Nara in 752, music from Tang Chinese masters was played in the ceremony. And the Shoso Inn, or imperial treasure house at Nara, still shows the varied instruments used in those ancient days. Singing and recitative, court music and monastic dance music formed the classical modes, while popular airs were strummed on the biwa, a lute, or the samisen, a three-stringed banjo. The Japanese had no great composers and wrote no books about music. Their simple compositions, played in five notes of the harmonic minor scale, had no harmony and no distinction of major and minor keys but almost every Japanese could play some one of the twenty instruments which had come over from the continent. And any one of these, when properly played, said the Japanese, would make the very dust on the ceiling dance. The dance itself enjoyed a vogue unparalleled in any other country, not so much as an appendage to love as in the service of religious or communal ceremony. Sometimes a whole village turned out in costume to celebrate a joyful occasion with a universal dance. Professional dancers entertained great audiences with their skill, and men as well as women, even in the highest circles, gave much time to the art. 
when Prince Genji, says the Lady Murasaki, danced the waves of the blue sea with his friend Tono Chujo, everyone was moved. Never had the onlookers seen feet tread so delicately, nor heads so exquisitely poised. So moving and beautiful was this dance, that at the end of it the emperor's eyes were wet, and all the princes and great gentlemen wept aloud. Meanwhile, all who could afford it adorned their persons not only with fine brocades and painted silks, but with delicate objects characteristic, almost definitive, of the old Japan. Shrinking ladies flirted from behind fans of alluring loveliness, while men flaunted netsuke, inro, and expensively carved swords. The inro was a little box attached to the belt by a cord. It was usually composed of several infolding cases carefully carved in ivory or wood, and contained tobacco, coins, writing materials, or other casual necessities. To keep the cord from slipping under the belt, it was bound at the other end to a tiny toggle, or netsuke, from ne, end, and tsuke, to fasten, upon whose cramped surface some artist had fashioned with lavish care the forms of deities or demons, philosophers or fairies, birds or reptiles, fishes or insects, flowers or leaves, or scenes from the life of the people. Here that impish humor in which Japanese art so far excels all others found free and yet modest play. Only the most careful examination can reveal the full subtlety and significance of these representations. But even a glance at this microcosm of fat women and priests, of agile monkeys and delightful bugs, cut upon less than a cubic inch of ivory or wood, brings home to the student the unique and passionate artistic quality of the Japanese people. Hidari, that is, left-handed, Jingaro, was the most famous of Japanese sculptures in wood. Legend told how he had lost an arm and gotten a name. When an offended conqueror demanded of Jingaro's daimyo the life of his daughter, Jingaro carved a severed head so realistically that the conqueror ordered the artist's right hand to be cut off as punishment for killing the daughter of his lord. It was Jingaro whose chisel formed the elephants and the sleeping cat at the shrine of Ieyasu at Nikko, and the gate of the imperial envoy at the Nishi Hongwan Temple in Kyoto. On the inner panels of this gate the artist told the story of the Chinese sage, who washed his ear because it had been contaminated by a proposal that he should accept the throne of his country, and the austere cowherd who quarreled with the sage for thus defiling the river. But Jingaro was merely the most characterful of the now nameless artists who adorned a thousand structures with lovingly carved or lacquered wood. The lacquer tree found in the islands a peculiarly congenial habitat and was nourished with skillful care. The artisans, sometimes covered with successive coats of lacquer, cotton, and lacquer, a form chiseled in wood. But more often they went to the pains of modeling a statue in clay, making from this a hollow mold, and then pouring into the mold several layers of lacquer, each thicker than before. The Japanese carver lifted wood to a full equality with marble as a material for art, and filled shrines, mausolea, and palaces with the fairest wood decoration known in Asia. 6. Architecture temples, palaces, the shrine of Ieyasu, homes. In the year 594, the Empress Suiko, being convinced of the truth or utility of Buddhism, ordered the building of Buddhist temples throughout her realm. Prince Shotoku, who was entrusted with carrying out this edict, brought in from Korea priests, architects, wood carvers, bronze founders, clay modelers, masons, gilders, tile makers, weavers, and other skilled artisans. This vast cultural importation was almost the beginning of art in Japan, for Shinto had frowned upon ornate edifices and had countenanced no figures to misrepresent the gods. From that moment Buddhist shrines and statuary filled the land. The temples were essentially like those of China, but more richly ornamented and more delicately carved. Here, too, majestic torii, or gateways, marked the ascent or approach to the sacred retreat. Bright colors adorned the wooden walls, Great beams held up a tiled roof gleaming under the sun, and minor structures, a drum tower, for example, or a pagoda, mediated between the central sanctuary and the surrounding trees. The greatest achievements of the foreign artists was the group of temples at Horiuji, raised under the guidance of Prince Shotoku near Nara, about the year 616. It stands to the credit of the most living of building materials that one of these wooden edifices has survived unnumbered earthquakes and outlasted a hundred thousand temples of stone. And it stands to the glory of the builders that nothing erected in later Japan has surpassed the simple majesty of this oldest shrine. Perhaps as beautiful and only slightly younger are the temples of Nara itself, above all the perfectly proportioned golden hall of the Todaiji temple there. 
Nara, says Ralph Adams Cram, contains the most precious architecture in all Asia. The next zenith of building in Japan came under the Ashikaga shogunate. Yoshimitsu, resolved to make Kyoto the fairest capital on earth, built for the gods a pagoda 360 feet high. For his mother, the Takakura Palace, of which a single door cost 20,000 pieces of gold, or $150,000. For himself, a flower palace that consumed five million dollars, and the golden pavilion of Kinkakuji for the glory of all. Hideyoshi, too, tried to rival Kublai Khan, and built at Momoyama a palace of pleasure, which his whim tore down again a few years after its completion. We may judge its magnificence from the day-long portal removed from it to adorn the temple of Nishi Hongwan. All day long, said its admirers, one might gaze at that carved portal without exhausting its excellence. Kano Yetoku played Ictinus and Phidias to Hideyoshi, but adorned his buildings with Venetian splendor rather than with Attic restraint. Never had Japan or Asia seen such a bounding decoration before. Under Hideyoshi, too, the gloomy castle of Osaka took form to dominate the Pittsburgh of Japan and become the death place of his son. Ieyasu inclined rather to philosophy and letters than to art, but after his death his grandson, Iemitsu, contented himself with a wooden shanty for his palace, lavished the resources of Japanese wealth and art to build around the ashes of Ieyasu at Nikko, the fairest memorial ever raised to any individual in the Far East. Here, ninety miles from Tokyo, on a quiet hill reached by a shaded avenue of stately cryptomerias, the architects of the shogun laid down first a series of spacious and gradual approaches, then an ornate but lovely Yomemon gate, then, by a brook crossed with a sacred and untouchable bridge, a series of mausolea in temples in lacquered wood, femininely beautiful and frail. The decoration is extravagant, the construction is weak, the omnipresent red paint flares like a hectic rouge amid the modest green of the trees. And yet a country incarnadined with blossoms every spring may need brighter colors to express its spirit than those that might serve and please a less impassioned race. We cannot quite call this architecture great, for the demon of earthquake has willed that Japan should build on a timid scale, and not pile stones into the sky to crash destructively when the planet wrinkles its skin. Hence the homes are of wood, and seldom rise beyond a story or two. Only the repeated experience of fire and the reiterated commands of the government prevailed upon the citizens of the cities, when they could afford it, to cover their wooden cottages and palaces with roofs of tile. The aristocracy, unable to raise their mansions into the clouds, spread them spaciously over the earth, despite an imperial edict limiting the size of a dwelling to 240 yards square. A palace was rarely one building. Usually it was a main structure connected by covered walks with subordinated edifices or various groups in the family. There was no distinction of dining room, living room, or bedroom. The same chamber could serve any purpose, for at a moment's notice a table might be laid down upon the matted floor or the rolled-up bedding might be taken from its hiding place and spread out for the night. Sliding panels or removable partitions separated or united the rooms, and even the latticed or windowed walls were easily folded up to give full play to the sun or the cooling evening air. Pretty blinds of split bamboo offered shade and privacy. Windows were a luxury. In the poorer homes the summer light found many openings, which in winter were blocked up with oiled paper to keep out the cold. Japanese architecture gives the appearance of having been born in the tropics, and of having been transported too recklessly into islands that stretch up their necks to shivering Kamchatka. In the more southern towns these fragile and simple homes have a style and beauty of their own, and offer appropriate dwellings for the once gay children of the sun. 7. Metals and Statues Swords, Mirrors, the Trinity of Horiuji, Colossi, Religion and Sculpture the sword of the samurai was stronger than his dwelling, for the metal workers of Japan spent themselves on making blades superior to those of Damascus or Toledo, sharp enough to sever a man from shoulder to thigh at a blow, and ornamented with guards and handles so highly decorated or so heavily inlaid with gems that they were not always perfectly adapted to homicide. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.